Well, hi there. Um, this is a flipped classroom presentation on the basics of oceanography marine bi for marine biology. And today we're going to look at salinity and the movement of air and water as it relates to our basic understanding of the ocean. Okay. Hopefully when we end this, um, you'll have a pretty good idea of uh, the movement of air and water across the planet as it relates to the basic motion of the Earth and also understand um, how salinity varies throughout the ocean. Okay? All right, so first, if we take a look at this first slide, uh, you can see that I have a picture of three containers of sea salt there. The one on the far left of the screen has a relatively small amount of salt in it. The one on the middle has a little bit more, and the one on the right has a lot more salt in it. Okay? You can think of this as sort of like Goldilocks and the three bears when she gets in and sees the different temperature porridge. This is your three choices. Okay, You get a teeny little bit of salt, a moderate amount of salt, or a lot of salt. And the question is, how much salt is found in a liter of seawater? So over on the right-hand side of the photo, you can see a liter of seawater sitting there. And what we want to try to figure out is which of these three amounts of salt is the correct amount of salt that would be dissolved in a single liter of seawater. All right. Now, if you take a look here, you can see that um, the ocean has varying amounts of salt in it. What this image shows is that there are um, a range, there's a range of salinity from about 34 here on this uh, map to about 37 and a half. And those numbers actually portray the number of parts of salt in a thousand parts of seawater. So 34 says that there's 34 parts of salt dissolved in a um, thousand parts of seawater. 37 and a half means that just that. There's 37 and a half parts of salt in a, part, in a thousand parts of seawater. Okay. Now, what you also want to notice here is that throughout this map, you see that the amounts of salt vary. All right, And they vary to some degree with latitude and to other degree to where they are in relationship to um, the continental land masses. All right? And um, when we look at this, we're going to next try to figure out, well, how much is the right amount of salt? And then from there, how does salinity vary according to the latitude on the Earth? So first, if we go back here, if we think about those numbers, 34 to 37 and a half, all right, in terms of parts per thousand, the middle container here contains the right amount of salt. There are 36 and a half grams of salt in that middle container, and that is the equivalent of about 36 parts per thousand, or 3.6 percent salt in uh, the oceans, okay? Then we want to look at what influences the salinity of the ocean's waters, all right? And we can see on the left-hand side of this particular slide, the two things that increase salinity are the freezing of seawater and evaporation, all right? On the right-hand side of the slide, we see the things that decrease salinity. First of all, precipitation, meaning rain or snow. Second of all, we have the melting of ice, all right? Third, we have input from river runoff. And lastly, we have groundwater flowing into the ocean from beneath the surface. So all of those things decrease salinity. Again, evaporation and freezing are the things that increase salinity. Okay. Now, if we look at that worldwide and take another look at the way that salinity varies globally, we can see on this diagram that um, near the equator, right, near zero degrees latitude, we see that salinity is relatively low, about 34 and a half parts per thousand. And then as we move north and south from the equator towards 30 degrees north and south latitude, we see that the salinity increases to its highest amount, right, close to 37 and a half parts per thousand, right? And then as we move back towards uh, more temperate areas in the Earth, we see that salinity decreases again. And then if this graph were to continue all the way to the poles, we'd see a slight increase in salinity uh, beyond where we see the range of the graph right now. All right. So given that, all right, it begs the question, what are the things that we saw on the previous slide, increases and decreases in salinity, are the most influential? And it turns out that it's the balance between evaporation and precipitation that does the most in terms of determining the salinity of the ocean in a given area of the Earth. So near the equator, there's a lot of rain, all right, and less evaporation in relationship to how much rain. At 30 degrees north and south latitudes, we have a lot more evaporation than we do precipitation. And then as we go back towards the 40 and 45 degree latitude ranges, we get a lot more precipitation than we do evaporation. So the salinity decreases, okay? So we can see the patterns within this. So 
let's keep that for our understanding of salinity right now and let's focus our attention here on the rotation of the earth and how that rotation right, influences the movement of packages of air and packages of water on the earth things that we know of as wind and currents okay so first off remember that the earth is spinning in a counterclockwise direction and it spins one full rotation each day all right since the earth is a varying circumference the Equator is a much larger circumference than at 30 or 45 or 60 degrees north or south latitude. The different parts of the Earth spin at different speeds. The equator has to move much faster to make it around a full rotation in one day than does any area north or south of it, and particularly as you get closer to the poles. And this differential velocity, all right, this differential spinning velocity, actually has an impact on the movement of water and air uh, in the northern and hum southern hemispheres. Take a look at this slide and we can see that what we're actually talking about here is the Coriolis effect. And what this is, is we see that objects moving in the northern and southern hemispheres actually tend to have a particular directionality to them because of what we call the Coriolis effect, which is caused by the differential velocities, all right? So the net result is that packages of air and water actually get deflected in a very consistent direction in the northern hemisphere and the opposite direction in the southern hemisphere, okay? What this picture is showing is that if you were to be on the equator and shooting a cannonball north, you, even if you aimed it straight north, the cannonball would actually move off to the right, okay? It would get deflected, and that's because when it's on the equator, it actually has the velocity of the equator. It's got a faster velocity, and then as it moves towards the north, all right, it's moving faster to the right, that counterclockwise direction, than the land mass beneath it or the ocean mass beneath it. So act, as a result, it gets deflected off to the right or appears to be deflected to the right. The opposite is true in the southern hemisphere. You shoot the same cannon towards the south pole and the cannonball gets deflected towards the left because it's moving in a counterclockwise direction faster than the area it's traveling over. And as a result, we get what we call the Coriolis effect, the movement to the right of objects in the, su in the northern hemisphere and the movement to the left of objects in the southern hemisphere. Okay? Now, this is important when we look at the packages of air. Right, what we call um, convection cells. All right, and we're going to connect all this in just a second in the next bunch of slides. But if you look at this particular slide, you can see that there are three flowing cells of air as we move from the equator towards the pole, sort of in each quadrant of the Earth here. All right. So if you look at the equator over on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's a red arrow showing that air is moving up. And then as it's in the upper part of the atmosphere, it moves towards the north or towards the south. And then about a third of the way up, you see that the air begins to drop back down towards the earth, and then it flows along the surface of the earth back towards the equator. Okay? So to understand why this happens and how this is connected to the Coriolis effect, let's take a look here. All right? In the upper left, we see that hot air rises. Right? When air is heated, then the molecules move faster, and when they move faster, they spread apart from one another, and as a result, they're less dense. When they're less dense, they raise up. Okay? Hot air also can hold more moisture, or warmer air can hold more moisture than cooler air. So rising air masses tend to have more moisture in them. Okay? Near the equator and also at the boundaries of two other sets of cells, that rising air diverges, one package towards the north, one package towards the south. So now it's been lifted up and it starts to diverge. All right? The thing about air that's been lifted up in altitude is that as it moves up in altitude, it also right, cools down. So as it cools down, its ability to hold moisture lessens and, right, it becomes more dense. So what we can see here is that the further the diverging air gets from the equator, it's now cooler, it holds less moisture, so therefore it rains, and then once it rains and is cooler, it becomes more dense, and as a result, it sinks down towards the earth again. When it hits the surface of the Earth, it flows back towards the equator in our first example because it's replacing the air that's being lifted all right, in the rising of the air and the or origin of this cell. Okay, if we look here, we can see it a little bit more clearly in this bigger global view. Right? You can see these three rotating masses of air, each one originating because air is rising all right, and then moving along towards, in this case, the north from the first cell 
All right, in the second cell, you can see that starting at about 45 degrees north latitude, air gets heated again, it rises up, moves back towards the equator in that second cell, and then drops back down. So we get these three rotating air masses, all right, which we call Hadley cells. And you can envision that these three Hadley cells all right, help us see why air is flowing right, on the surface of the Earth. So these things create what we call our prevailing winds. And you can see on this diagram that they're labeled the trade winds and the westerlies. Okay? And then lastly, we can see here that the formation of these wind patterns on the surface of the Earth all right, is influenced by the Coriolis effect itself. As you can see pictured on this particular diagram, all right, the air that is moving back towards the equator as it returns to Earth in the first cell is flowing from north right, towards south, from the subtropical high towards the equator, all right, where it says the intertropical convergence zone there. And as it moves back towards the equator, it gets deflected by the Coriolis effect. So therefore, the prevailing winds all right, in the northern hemisphere flow towards the equator and they get moved to the right, they get deflected to the right, so we have them going from an easterly direction towards a westerly direction, so we call these trade winds. Right? The opposite directionality is true in the southern hemisphere, but we see the same impact. The packet of air gets deflected towards the left in the southern hemisphere. What this also does for us is it gives us a chance to put together some of the language that we sometimes hear in terms of describing uh, areas of the Earth. All right? And in the upper diagram, we see that we have what some, an area called the doldrums at the equator. This is an area where there doesn't happen to be much wind because that air is rising up. As a result, there's little wind there. All right? And then we see up above that the horse latitudes. And those horse latitudes are named for places where ships used to get becalmed. And when there wasn't enough wind, they got worried about whether there'd be enough water on the ship. And there wasn't going to be enough water for the horses and for the sailors, so they tossed the horses overboard, hence the name horse latitudes.